Hello and welcome to another banging episode of the Stripping the Dipping podcast. You're joined by usual co-host, the MDM, the modern day Morgan Freeman, aka AMG Dens. And of course, I'm joined by my formidable co-host, the brilliant F1 Black. And, you know, we decided that we'd start the season with something a bit interesting, uh, you know, following another sensational episode recorded last week with Brian Herter himself, the legend himself, the Laguna Seca legend himself of course and uh yeah we have literally a bachelor of science in motorsport and a technical director you know of a motorsport team that being brian harter autosport so without further ado can everyone listening to this episode please give a round of applause in the background to kyle compton kyle how are you doing today i'm doing great thanks for having me Oh, super, super exciting to have you on. I can imagine that, you know, Georgina and Black were catching up with you behind the scenes. And as we like to ask with all of our guests there, Carl, is um, where did your passion for motorsport begin? And what was the motor racing scene like growing up in Dublin, Ohio? Were there any particular drivers or teams you grew up supporting? And, you know, were your family involved in any kind of racing or mechanical kind of stuff? Yeah, I got to give all the credit to my dad on that one. Uh, my dad's the real um, race fan. Um, it's kind of just, I still love it, but it's kind of more of a job for me. And um, I love my job, but I kind of keep it separate. My dad, growing up, he watched everything. Formula One, IndyCar, NASCAR, drag racing, MotoGP. So it was just life from day one. Um, I started racing quarter midgets when I was nine years old. Um, I raced for eight or nine years. The motorsports scene in the Midwest was huge. I mean, there were three quarter midget tracks in central Ohio. My hometown was three hours away from Indianapolis. So I spent a lot of time there. And we were just down the road from the um, original Ray Hall shop that was in Hilliard, Ohio. So um, there's like um, uh, pictures of me at the shop as a kid. And, um, you know, I have Bobby Ray Hall's autograph on a hat in at home in my parents house and so um it, it's something i kind of grew up with and then it's it's crazy to see how my career played out and i ended up um ended up working at ray hall so it's been my whole life but the passion really started with my dad he's the he's the real real racing nut <laughs> well, a huge shout out to dad there. And absolutely, Carl, you know, I can definitely see the organic synergy of, you know, having a father that's into motorsport and so passionate about it. And like you said as well, racing the quarter midgets, which actually look really cool as well. Like for those of um, our listeners at home, it's essentially something like a, like a buggy, would you say? And you can like drift it around in circles and, and basically like go around oval circuits as well in, in really competitive kind of uh, mile lengths. I guess that's the, the the thing behind them, Carl. But also, kind of one thing we wanted to get into whilst we're on the early phase of your career there is your PSP. And no, we're not talking about PlayStation Portable for those born in the 90s. PSP for Path to Shining Progression. And in such, Carl, like, you've had a really interesting experience of, you know, being an intern back in 2014 for IndyCar. You know, could you talk more about that and just, like, basically bridging the gap of having a passion and even like you mentioned as well racing quarter midgets um you know going to the circuits seeing the body shops knowing some of the race drivers as well to actually making that step into the motorsport and into the industry yeah so i graduated high school in 2013 and went decided to go to um, iupui in indianapolis for university um, get my motorsports engineering degree and uh, my goal was to have an internship every summer that I was in school. Um, it, it's tough as a freshman because you don't really have um, a lot of skills. Uh, you haven't taken any like super pertinent motorsports classes yet. Um, I had an interview with Andretti and I didn't get it. Um, but luckily I had this opportunity with IndyCar and uh, help, working with their tech, technical inspection team and basically just using a roller to um, under the cars as they would come through tech to make sure they were all meeting minimum ride height. Um, you know, not once again, not a ton of engineering right off the bat, but you got to learn other pieces of the industry. So it was great experience learning how tech inspection works, how the series interacts with the teams and with the manufacturers of Delara and, um, you know, how a race weekend is um, formulated with sessions and, and the work in between sessions. So, um, that was kind of my basis for motorsports. 
uh, to try to build that base before I got into the really deep, deep engineering side. That's really interesting that you mentioned that, Carl. And like you said, too, I mean, it, it might not seem like a lot to begin with, but even still, that's practically, you know, the fundamental aspects of the sport. And like you mentioned, working in tech, working in the, the scrutineering kind of elements of the, the paddock there with the cars being rolled in to make sure they comply with all the regulations is, is really key. And I guess you kind of see kind of how things work in relation to ride height, like you mentioned, too, or making sure that the planks or skid plates at the bottom of the car don't you know absolutely you know get shredded and, and comply with certain restrictions and stuff like that too and also you mentioned there as well like working with Delara which is interesting because now I know well you guys work with Hyundai or Hyundai as the pronunciation goes so we'll get into that a bit later but also like in interning and working your way up Carl you had a really awesome opportunity and you know you work towards it and put the hard work and grind into becoming a race engineer for or an assistant race engineer for Rahul Letterman what was that experience like in terms of the dynamics of that organization because on one hand you've got a really successful driver and I know you're a fan of him as we're talking about Bobby Rahul but then also like a really big personality in David Letterman as well that has like a whole talk, talk show and it's like one of the biggest you know tv presenters in the world how would that compare to any of the other things that you know you've you've done kind of in the the world of motorsport yeah that was the that's the biggest team i've ever worked for um and you know uh, we're we are the biggest we've ever been at brian hart autosport right now and we're on that path but um, we're not quite that size yet and, you know, when I first started with Brian Herta, it was small team, small budget. You kind of got a, um, it's kind of a different engineering style because you understand the budget limitations. And so you're, you're trying to optimize within your budget constraints. Whereas working at Ray Hall, um, that, you know, we had, you know, we were the BMW factory team. We had um, incredible support from BMW and, they, I look at it as blank check engineering. I mean, if you wrote a good enough report and proposal on what you wanted to do and why and what the potential gains were, you were going to get approved for that money 99% of the time. So um, it was a completely different experience and it got to teach me kind of the proper way to do things. Um, you know, there's kind of, uh, you always got to have that money aspect in the back of your mind of, um, you know, there's a, there's a proper way to do it. And on that team, we had the money to do it. Um, and then as you kind of maybe go down the ladder, you have to think, okay, well, yes, this is the proper way to do it. We can't, we don't have the budget to do that. So how can we make the most out of what we've got? So um, yeah, uh, BMW Team Ray Hall was massive. Um, those years were so cr critical to my uh, career and development. I could imagine, Carl. And again, it's it's really interesting and insightful to see, even just from like a bigger team's perspective, like you know Letterman and 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 Ray Hall as well. In that sense, compared to Brian Herter's Autosport as well, just the comparison, how those run, and the parallels staying within kind of cost measures. And we've seen even just across the pond in Europe with the Formula One, there's been a whole kind of push for a cost cap, and you know a certain team which will may remain unnamed before we get in trouble, of course, doing something something maybe they shouldn't have in relation to that but could you give us examples there Kyle of like things you might have to do to try and stay within a cost cap in terms of parts in terms of like you know maybe just like trying to maximize performance from like maybe one gearbox until it's worn out are, are there examples like that you could probably give our, our viewers for for the insight well, for me, starting off as a, a systems engineer or a data acquisition engineer and then working up to uh, assistant race engineer, it, for me, initially, it was a lot in the wiring. Um, you know, at the top level, if you, um, you know, if you if you chafe a wire or you fail a sensor or a connector rips off or something like this, you're uh, at the highest level, you're just you're going to replace it. Like if there's a problem, you're going to put something new on. Um, whereas, you know, the more and more budget is in your mind, the more and more you're like, okay, can we repair this? Can we repair this? Can we repair this? So um, I think that's the biggest initial thing. As you get into the lead engineering side of things, um, you know, you're kind of looking at, uh, you're not just looking at optimizing the car. You're like, where is our money best spent? 
the best example is, you know, we're in endurance racing now with Hyundai. And um, if we, I would much rather have a spare set of dampers than spend that money on developing our primary set of dampers, because I know that if we crash and we lose one, then we don't have a spare. So allocating your resources properly is a huge key to success. And, um, you know, I'm a big goals oriented person. And if your goal is to win a championship, you got to be finishing races and you got to prioritize reliability first um, and then work on, you know, being the fastest after that. I mean, you look at, uh, uh, you know, you guys are big F1 fans. You look at Ferrari this year. Um, you know, I think they're going to look back on this and kick themselves because their biggest struggle kind of was reliability. Of course, and I think a great kind of parallel and comparison there as well, Carl, because it, it is interesting. And, you know, going into that F1 season, a lot of people thought, well, you know, what, what did Ferrari have to lose? Then when they turned up in testing and they were setting the fastest times, we were like, oh, OK, this looks promising. And then obviously when they went on to win the first two races, or I think it was the first race and then the second one was quite close between Charles and Max, we knew there was going to be a fight. But then, like you mentioned as well, you have to kind of plan across the season and look at the longevity of parts, look at the longevity of, you know, your resources in terms of whether or not you want to spend all the resources on repair, repairing new bits and trying to bring new performance upgrades every week, or whether you kind of like spread that cost equilaterally and kind of also build towards the future as well. If you bring an evolution of the car the following year. So it's really interesting. And actually on the topic of cars as well, I'm going to tag Blag into this because it'd be really interesting to stay here about the race structure and kind of the considerations that go into touring car racing, which I'm sure Black will dive into a bit more. So Black, I'm handing it to you. Brilliant. Yeah. Uh, well, Carl, it's been fascinating so far and I'm, I'm going to ask a bit more about the kind of human side and the competition side. So um, can you tell us a bit about like how the engineering evolves over a weekend? So considering, you know, you've got practice, then you're ramping up for some sort of qualifying and then you're going for the race. How does your role as an engineer sort of fluctuate or how does your focus shift over that sort of race weekend? Uh, it's a good question. There's so many things that go into it and um, obviously the, the first obvious one that I think most engineers focus on is simply the car setup and optimizing that as much as possible. Um, I think some engineers actually might over prioritize that, um, because there's, there's other things that actually get a lot of consideration as well, including like the mental aspect of the driver and team, um, uh, in endurance racing, you know, we're dealing with multiple drivers. So. I'm always focused on making sure that my drivers are confident and comfortable going into the race. And so every setup change I make, even though I'm trying to make the car better and faster, I understand that if I, um, I make a change that makes the car, um, very unstable, I could, I could immediately hurt a driver's confidence with that. And it may take some time to get that back. Um, so you got to balance that as well as the weekend progresses, then you start focusing. Ideally, you get your race setup figured out. If you get your race setup figured out early enough, then you start to look at, okay, what changes do we want to make specifically for qualifying? Um, you know, there are some weekends that happen so short, especially with the, the COVID, um, shortened weekends you had weekends where it was like okay we're going to qualify our race car setup and hope it goes well and the, but we know we've got a good car for the race so in a perfect world you're able to come up with a completely different setup for qualifying um because you know the 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 car on low fuel new tires the setup you want for that is going to be completely different on new tires full fuel but still needing to be successful at the end of the stint with you know 30 lap old tires and then after you get through qualifying, um, you know, setup goes out the window and you become a strategist. Um, you know, we have lots of meetings. That's probably one of my favorite parts of the job, honestly. Um, and every team does it slightly differently, but every team is going to have a strategy report before the race. And we're going to go over it all together. Um, it's been one of my favorite parts of working with Brian. He's one of the most brilliant strategic minds, I think, in the sport. And so um, having him be part of that is great. I've learned a lot from him. Um, you know, we've worked on our own strategy report together. And, um, you know, 
that the focus shifts completely to that. And we have a pretty good plan and idea of what's going to happen in the race before, before it even starts. I mean, at the end of the day, prep preparation is everything. So I know yellow history, um, I, you know, I have all the statistics on the race and previous races like it the last four or five years of that race. And, um, I've got all that data and information readily available during the race in case we need to change plans or strategies. Gosh, that's, that's fascinating. And, and do you know what? I think you touched on um, something that really fascinates me about motorsport, which is it's kind of this mix of man or, or person and machine, or you know, where science meets art or where sort of uh, intellect meets emotion. So you talked a bit about keeping your drivers sort of confident and relaxed. Um, and, and actually, you're, you're the lead engineer. So I presume you're also thinking about the, the squad of mechanics and other engineers. What are yep. the sorts of things are you doing or thinking about as a leader, I suppose, over an endurance uh, sort of period of time? What, what, are you, what are you doing as a leader to, to keep the team morale up and focused? This is uh, one of my favorite parts of the sport. And I think it's, um, uh, I think it's undervalued in a lot of, in a lot of ways. Um, you know, with Brian Herta, we've tried to create a culture that's very, um, uh, positive and has we, we've got a lot of chemistry um you know i i truly love everybody that i'm working with right now and that that means a lot towards success um i've seen on multiple teams throughout um you know my career one bad apple can sour an entire bunch and so we really try to keep people on the same page. And, and ultimately, I think leadership is, is just about communication. So, um, you know, I, I'm frequently talking with the chief mechanic, um, the driver, our team manager, obviously ownership. Um, you know, we, we've got different departments at the track that all have to be operating simultaneously. And, you know, uh, our lead engineers are typically the ones um, kind of that web of communication, you know, I have to communicate to um, our tire guys that are working under a completely separate tent, getting our tires prepped and ready. I have to communicate with them about pressures. We've got everyone handling fuel in a completely other section. Um, so I have to communicate them what fuel we're going to start with, what fuel we need ready in pit lane to go. Um, so, you know, we have to start with the drivers and developing an initial plan for the session. And then that has to be communicated um, to a lot of different people. And uh, if that is done well, um, you have a lot of happy employees. And I think happy employees are productive employees. So um, after sessions, uh, it's also important to listen and be responsive to um, uh, people's frustrations. You know, uh, I think we do a great job of if, if there are problems on our team, we work really hard to resolve them. And um, I think that's probably one of my one of my biggest strengths on my kind of uh, PSP, as you call it. So, uh, that's brilliant. You've got me taking notes here, thinking about my day job, you know, <laughs> on leadership uh, and listening uh, to the problems. Fantastic. So um, we sort of covered this, but um, just by talking about it, but you obviously made a switch from you know, IndyCar into touring car, um, it would be really fascinating to hear the differences. Um, so, I mean, first of all, what precipitated your move to touring car? And, and secondly, what would you say the biggest challenges are strategy-wise? You said that was an area that you really enjoy in both of those sports. Well, um, the move was purely um, Brian Herta. I mean, we, I interned for Brian back when we were doing glo global rally cross, and that was one of the most fun years of my career. Um, I've got a, got a soft spot for um, rally cross. I think it's a lot of fun. Um, and uh, um, at the end of that season, um, you know, they were kind of up in the air. And so I went back to Ray Hall and um, worked on the BMWs and the Indy cars. Um, and when Brian got the Hyundai deal, that's when he kind of, um, uh, started trying to recruit me back and the stars just kind of aligned and it, it was the right time for them and it was the right time for my career. Um, but it was also a, a risk on his part. I mean, I was 23 years old and he made me a lead engineer. So, 
um, that was uh, um, a really big part of my career. And for him to have that sort of uh, trust and belief in me meant a lot. So I, I would give him the credit for that move for me. Um, I want to see Brian Herta Autosport back in IndyCar, and um, I'd love to see them back in the, the highest um, uh, ranks of sports car racing as well. I'd love to get into the WeatherTech series. So we, we've grown every year since I've been here, and I hope that continues. Um, we've, we're in TCR right now with Hyundai, and it's it's been a lot of fun. The big strategy difference is, um, you know, these races are timed. They're not um, a number of laps. So it, it kind of changes your philosophy a lot because um, we have a, at the beginning of the race, I know how many laps it's going to be if the whole race goes green, but, you know, that almost never happens. So with every yellow, it actually shortens the race. Um, you know, a general rule of thumb, like two yellow laps are equal to one green lap. And so every time you have a full course yellow, it shortens the race and that changes your strategy. Um, then on top of that, I would say the biggest thing about TCR is we have a, um, a, a refueling limitation where a full fill has to be at least 52 seconds. And in racing, 52 seconds is an eternity. Um, I mean, an Indy car can fuel in like seven seconds. Um, so because of that, you want to get all of your pit stops, as many of your pit stops done under yellow as you can. Um, it's about 1.5 liters of fuel per second. Every time there's a yellow, if you can get at least, you know, 25 liters in, you're probably going to pit because that's um, over 15 seconds of fuel. And you'd rather lose that time under yellow than under green. So um, I would say there's just a complete mentality shift from sprint racing. And even though they're long races, I still call them sprint because it's a, you're going to a lap count. And that's IndyCar, Formula One, most of these. But when you start to get into the sports car racing where you're doing four, six, 12, 24-hour races, um, it, it, it changes your mentality quite a bit. Fascinating. What came to mind was like maybe the Olympic Games where, you know, you see these fantastic sprinters, but in the heats, they're trying to get through to the next round in the slowest possible time. <laughs> so I, I suppose you're you're trying to get to the front of the field at the end of the time. But if you go too quickly at any point, you might be sort of burning up fuel or, you know, you might be creating a strategic inefficiency. Would you say that's sort of how you look at it? Yeah, it's so true. And, you know, we, we've got all these general rules rules of thumb, but it just kind of um, you want to try to break the races down into phases. And like I said, stick with goals. Um, you know, uh, race car drivers are incredible, but they've got so much going on in the cockpit that everything I can do for them to, um, you know, allow their mind to focus on just the racetrack. I, I want to do that. And so for like a 24 hour race, um, we typically view the first 18 hours as purely survival. You know, I, I think races are won and lost in the last six hours. So the only way the first 18 hours goes poorly is if you crash or you end up in the garage. Um, and getting that through to drivers, you know, uh, drivers want to go forward. Um, and I love that about them. And so it's kind of my job and our job as engineers and strategists to kind of reel them in. And um, it's really special when you get a driver that uh, you, you have that relationship where you trust. Um, uh, you know, I've been fortunate to work with some incredible drivers in my career. And um, it's pretty cool when you're kind of on the radio and you're like, okay, let's just sit here. We, we, we need to save some tires, save some fuel. And then, um, you know, other times when you say, hey, let's go to the front and they make it happen. So that's, it's a, it's a cool relationship, the driver and engineer. That's a, that's a fascinating moment for me to hand back to my co-host, Dens, because what you might not know about him is he's a bit of a sim racer. And, um, you know, him and his teammate, Mike Farler, Mike, they might need to hear that um, in a 24-hour race, the first 18 hours are all about survival. So on that note, Dens, I'll hand back to you. 
<laughs> Shots fired there, Black. Thank you. Uh, just so you know, it wasn't me that crashed at the Daytona on the 24th. I'd, I'd just add that in there. But thank you. But uh, Kyle, um, you know, on the topic of which as well, like um, we'll come back to the strategy element in a moment because it's really fascinating and I don't want us to lose the essence of that. But just to give our viewer kind of a more like, you know, overview of the car and just like the series too, you know, what is the key to unlocking the pace of the Hyundai Elantra NTC? You know, it's like a front wheel drive car, I imagine, as most touring cars are, and also a four cylinder engine as well. I imagine also it's kind of like maybe a one tire supplied rule as well with Michelin, since it happens to be the Michelin Pilot series. And on top of that as well, what would you also describe working with a division or a works factory division like Hyundai North America too, in terms of parts, in terms of development, and bouncing ideas for the future as well? Uh, yeah, Hyundai has been really great. Um, you know, we got a really nice package uh, from Hyundai Motorsports Germany. Um, uh, our job is really just to adapt it to the American scene. Um, like you said, uh, we're uh, we run Michelin. Um, they don't run Michelin over there. Our fuel is slightly different. Um, uh, the European series are typically more sprint based, whereas we're more of an endurance based series. So. Um, <laughs> Uh, we had a great package, you know, right out of the box from Hyundai. The Elantra NTCR is uh, fast and it's made some improvements over its uh, predecessor, the Veloster NTCR that we, we had a lot of success with. And um, it's really just optimizing the package. Yeah, front wheel drive creates a lot of um, unique differences. Um, uh, I'd say the two biggest is... Uh, it puts a lot of weight on the front axle. So, you know, when we've brought in um, engineers from rear wheel drive backgrounds, they're kind of blown away at the percentage we have on the uh, percentage of weight we've got on the front axle. And there's just no way around it. The rear, you know, I've, I heard one engineer say the rear tires are really just there to hold the exhaust off the ground. Um, and it's kind of true. You're doing everything through the front tire, braking, turning, acceleration. Um, so a lot of focus is put on the tire and tire management and then power down is a struggle. It's the, the biggest reason why you want rear wheel drive is under acceleration. You get weight shift to the rear tires. So with a rear wheel drive car, that's great. The faster you go, the more weight you get on the rear and it's kind of, they're both working in the same direction. Whereas front wheel drive, you get the opposite. You get this acceleration forward that brings weight off of your front tires and um that is a, a balance and a, and a limitation on your acceleration so um, cause a lot of struggles it also is a completely different driving style um you kind of gotta attack the entry of the corner much quicker in tcr or in front wheel drive because you kind of want to get all your rotation out of the way before you go to power um, because it's, it's, uh, you kind of want to drag race out of the corner because you don't, you don't want to be turning and accelerating with those same tires. Of course. And just on that note as well, there, Carl, like another element that you touched on, it was really important. I think raised in some of the questions Black talks about too, was how important is it to fine tune the setup and just get it in the right window? Cause you talked about like the drive trains and the characteristics of both of them. And in a way as well, like how the characteristic of a front wheel drive car will change over a stint. Because when you have the fuel at the beginning of the, the race, I guess, with the fuel tank on the rear axle and then the drivetrain on the front, it's probably a bit more balanced. But then as time goes by and the fuel load eases up on the rear, then also that also has different characteristics on the tire wear and the scrub on the fronts and how much kind of weight is also there too and just the rate of tire wear and such as well. So how key is it to just get the right setup and where do you find the compromise between like finding a setup that is, you know, great for performance and time, but also finding a setup that doesn't kill tires on really hot days or on other in other kind of circumstances become really edgy or nervous for a driver towards the end of a stint? Yeah, it's um it's a tricky balance and that's uh um kind of the the main reason i have a job um 
it's it's tough you bring up the weather portion and that's a, a huge piece of it is chasing the track and it's why simulation has become more and more prevalent um ultimately you want to optimize your time throughout an entire stint right so if we say a stint is 30 laps you know if you're way too fast at the beginning of the stint you'll probably be really slow at the end of the end of the stint and vice versa. So you want to try to get as much consistency as you can, and you want to just have the lowest total time. You don't need the fastest lap in that 30 um, lap stint, but you want to have the, the be able to do those all 30 laps as quickly as possible. So in TCR, that typically ends up us being, we're typically going to have a lot of oversteer at the beginning of the stint. Um, that's going to kind of go away with as the front, the peak of the front tire wears away and the tire and the fuel burns off in the middle of the stint. You're then going to have um, kind of that's when your car is probably the best balance uh, and when the drivers are the happiest. Um, and then at the end of the stint, you're typically going to going to trend towards understeer as those front tires just fall off a cliff. Um, you know, you're putting so much heat and energy into them. They just can't last forever. So, um, you know, I, I had my driver conference call this morning and that was kind of the theme. They, the drivers did not like the car at the beginning of the stint, um, in the race. They felt like every time we came in and pitted and put new tires on that the car was very nervous, but ultimately they recognized that that was the fastest um, ultimate approach to being successful in the race. So after five, 10 laps, then the car calmed down and, and we, we felt like we were the fastest for those, um, last two thirds of the stint. That's a really intriguing insight, Carl. And again, just to kind of, you know, take that into account as well, just how, you know, tire, um, just even with the track conditions and the heat, how it affects the tires over a stint, like you mentioned as well, driver confidence. And that's a huge thing that I guess you mentioned with Black too, and talking to the drivers and having the consultations with them and the debriefs and seeing kind of what works for them, seeing what is what it's worth because, you know, it, it's kind of cool to have a setup that's really quick. But then having said that, if you don't have the abilities or, or the confidence to kind of run that setup and you bend the car, then that's not a result at all. Whereas also, I guess sometimes it comes down to the driver as well to try and adapt. And, you know, that's what we see with all the great drivers. It doesn't matter what kind of balance of car you give them. They understand fundamentally the characteristics and adapt the driving style to cater to that car or the type characteristics at that time as well. So it's really intriguing. And even in touring car racing, where I feel it's more bunched up it's even more competitive that becomes more prevalent as well and on the topic of competition as well Carl, the last thing i wanted to ask you about on to on the topic of the cars is what is the bop so like the balance of performance like for the touring car series how do the officials go about you know like basically trying to balance out the performance of the different manufacturers that enter uh, how much of that plays a role into you know like how the cars perform would you say that the, the hyundai is uh competitive at a certain type of track or maybe there's another manufacturer car that um is competitive elsewhere because we see in the world of gt3 racing but also in like le mans prototypes that um there's like a bop for those type of cars and there's certain tracks that suit let's say the mercedes amg but then there are other circuits that suit the more mid-rear cars like the Ferraris or Lamborghinis or Audis. So it'd be interesting to see if we get a similar thing as well in the world of touring car racing. Yeah, it's the exact same. Um, BOP is a, a necessary evil, unfortunately. It's um, not, not the most fun part of the sport, but it's what allows us to get this great racing between, for us, Hyundai, Audi, Honda, and Alfa Romeo. Um, and yeah, just like you said, I mean, we just got back from Daytona. It's probably our worst track because it's so power sensitive. There's so much percentage of the lap spent at uh, 100% throttle. Um, whereas we are strongest in um, braking and, and lateral acceleration mid corner. So um, we do well at the smaller, more grip sensitive tracks like Lime Rock and Most Port and um, the shorter tracks where our competitors, you know, uh, maybe Alpha or Audi who won Daytona, um, they do well at the power tracks like a, a Daytona, Road America, Watkins Glen. So um, it's definitely a balance. And, and IMSA has a, a really intricate 
algorithm for um, trying to keep it as fair as possible. That's really intriguing to, to hear. And I'm sure like a lot of us fans too, that are motorsport enthusiasts will, will love that. And I think a lot of the people that haven't really explored the world of touring car racing will love to see that too. Because, you know, I mean, obviously the likes of Formula One and, and IndyCar have that kind of thing where, oh, actually it's a bit different because IndyCar is more of a spec series and it comes down, I guess, to the indiv individual teams and the data that they have and their philosophy of running a car. Whereas in Formula One, it's more just resource intensive and about the budget and, and the kind of stuff that you can hire as well but to bring it back to touring car racing it, it's a really interesting middle ground and for me kind of one that I, I love more in, in that kind of nature that you have a BOP which enables multiple manufacturers to come in and from week to week you don't know who's going to be the winner because there are certain tracks that suit certain characteristics like you mentioned and I guess the engineering challenge that comes with that is being able to actually you know find the quickest way to make the car go around so really intriguing to get an insight from you as well carl and what i'll do is i'll tag black back in because i know um this is a really interesting one since we had him on the podcast last week as well black i'll let you take away the next set of questions yeah absolutely so um you've already covered it to some extent carl because you talked about brian herter sort of being a key factor in your career and, and picking you at uh, 23 to be lead engineer at this team um, but what is it like working with Brian Herter? And, and added to that, um, does you know his experience as a driver and now as a sort of race engineer, I suppose, does that make it easier to sort of work with him as an engineer? Yeah, I think different perspectives are always a bonus. And I think it's helped me with success in my career. You know, I, I was a race car driver for a few years as a kid my early internships were basically as a mechanic. Um, not, not a very good one. I, I think everyone would say I'm a much better engineer than mechanic, but um, Brian's the same way, right? His experience as a driver and a strategist and a team owner and this and that, um, it just makes him a more well-rounded individual. And um, he's such a great resource um, and a wealth of knowledge that, um, you know, that that's kind of the, the hierarchy of a, a proper team, in my opinion, is where um, each, as information flows up the ladder, um, a, a round of questions should be able to be answered. And so the most important, toughest questions are the ones that get to Brian. And um, he's so great at handling that. And, uh, you know, IndyCar is great because you get to listen into the radio and you get to see how calm, cool, and collected Brian is, and it is the exact same way to work with, um, you know, my first race back in 2019 as lead engineer, Brian sat right next to me, um, just to, you know, uh, be there for me if I needed anything in my first race. And, um, obviously it's a little, uh, makes you a little nerve nervous with the, the boss man sitting right next to you. But at the end of the day, once the green flag flies, it was really comforting. And I could kind of um, uh, double check all my strategy calls with him. And, um, you know, I think his, um, strength as a team owner is putting his faith in the right people and, and putting the right people in positions to succeed. You know, it's easy for ownership and leadership and management to put people, set people up for failure. And that that's never a good thing. So Ryan has always put me in positions to succeed. So it makes my job a lot easier. That's a fascinating insight into the man, Brian Herter. And, and it sounds like, because, you know, not every driver is going to have that quality, you know, to be frank, when you see, you know, I know there's adrenaline in the system when you hear Formula One drivers or racing drivers after a race. And, you know, they seem to be, it seems to be as a young child, an individual sport. And maybe what Brian has is something that sort of transcends, transcends that, um, personality trait you might see in drivers uh, and he, he's really thoughtful about other people uh, which is really fascinating let me um let me ask you a question because i think we're recording this and you may have already had your first race of the season at daytona is that right yeah yeah fantastic so you've had your tests and you've had your first race of the season how do you prepare for a new season like does the car change uh you know do you, do you, do the tires change the drivers change what what are the variables and what are the things you're focusing on to be ready so i would say in sports car racing you get a new car every two to three years 
Um, we're fortunate that we got to stick with the Elantra this year, but you know, two years ago we we switched from the Veloster to the Elantra. So every every two to three years will be a new car change. Um, pretty much every off season, you're going to have a new set of drivers. Um, I've got, uh, you know, last year I worked with uh, Tyler Maxson and Mason Felipe. This year I've got Robert Wickens and Harry Gottsacker. Um, so that that's definitely a big piece of it. I think um, the, the off season is honestly one of our most important times. And I think uh, that's an interesting perspective that fans don't get to see. Um, I know back when I was with BMW, especially like for the sports car teams, IMSA typically tries to take a break so that if any teams want to go to Le Mans, they can. And so the teams that don't go to Le Mans, that ends up being our biggest break of the season. Um, I would view the summer as more of a break than the off season. Um, uh, this was the biggest one I'd ever had, but still, as soon as we are off track in Atlanta for the last race of the season, we are full focus on Daytona. Um, you know, it's tricky, you know, I envy IndyCar where the 500 is in May and they've got a few months to get ready for their biggest race of the season. It, it, I think a lot of people in IMSA fans and competitors would say Daytona is the biggest race of the season. And so you're starting the season with arguably the biggest race. And that is, that can be very stressful. So um, yeah, I mean, November, December, January, it is 100% Daytona prep. Um, uh, you do full reports on the previous season, a lot of conversations about how we can improve and be better. And um, there's obviously testing. Uh, we made a lot of improvements this off season. So um, but yeah, I would say the, the biggest differences are typically change in personnel. Um, you know, it's, it's a, it's a sport that has its seasons and at the end of each season, you're going to have turnover with drivers, with mechanics, with engineers. And so the other struggle of Daytona is it's also an introduction for a lot of people. Um, and the first time some people are meeting and getting to work together. So another big piece of my job, especially at Daytona, is to try to blend these new personalities together. So, um, you know, communication is so key and we, we, I think we started off on a good foot, but uh, we're definitely going to keep improving in that sense. Fascinating. And, uh, you know, you mentioned that you had Robert Wickens as a driver this season and that completely passed me by and he has a special place in many people's hearts after um, the accident that he had, um, what must be five years ago now, I think, uh, possibly in uh, in IndyCar. How how's he doing? And um, yeah, how how was that first race with him? Uh, it was great. I, I've really enjoyed working with Robert. Um, you know, last year at Daytona was kind of his first real race back. Um, he got uh, uh, two wins last year with his co-driver, Mark Wilkins. But in both of those races, Robert qualified and started the race. Mark finished. And Mark was the one to take the checkered flag. And, um, you know, I know that's something Robert thinks about. And um, I think this year really determined to get him his first his first win with him finishing and him getting to take the checkered flag. And um, I, I really want to be a part of that. I think that's going to be a special moment. But um, despite all that, you know, Robert is such a professional and he, um, you know, we, we are focused on the championship and that, that I think is um, where, what he wants to accomplish, what I want to accomplish. Um, uh, you know, he, he got some wins last year, but they didn't win the championship. And, I think, um, you know, I, I was fortunate enough to lead engineer the car that won the championship in 2020 and 2021. I had a bit of a down year last year. And so it's kind of a, a bounce back year for me as well. I think uh, um, so far, Robert and I have been a really great pairing and Harry has been a, um, a great co-driver to Robert. And I think the three of us have a lot of success in our future together. That's fantastic. And, and before I hand back to Denz, I guess um, something that struck me that you said earlier, you, you sort of talked about this, I don't know, i got a sense of mission, you know, let's bring Brian Herter Autosport back to IndyCar, to the top flight. Um, and, and obviously thinking about you and your career as well, how do you do that, either for yourself or, or for the team? What would be the progression for the team to, and, and yourself to get back to IndyCar? I mean, 
you, you know, we, we've got an incredible deal with Hyundai right now, and that is the primary focus. Um, but, you know, Brian and our other team owner, Sean Jones, you know, they have a very interesting job. Um, uh, you know, motorsports is, uh, uh, is changing every day. Right. And so, um, you know, we see teams, um, go out of business randomly all the time. I mean, um, I, I can't think of any great examples off the top of my head, but I think you just always got to keep your options open. And, um, you know, our philosophy has been, let's try to attract good people, um, uh, good employees, good drivers, and uh, kind of let them take us in, in, in a direction. And um, we've had incredible success with Hyundai. We really hope to keep that up for the near future. Uh, but we're always kind of, uh, you're always kind of looking for um, what's next and other ways to expand. And, um, you know, I don't know if there's anything really on the horizon, but from my perspective as an engineer, we are trying to operate, even though we're in TCR, we're trying to operate at an IndyCar or a, a GTP level so that if and when those opportunities come, we're ready for them. And, you know, I think if um, we were to be given a, you know, a, a a GTD car, a GT3 car, an LMP3 car, an LMP2 car, I think we could be instantly successful. And I think we've built the foundation for where, you know, if we were, if we had the opportunity to participate in IndyCar again, um, there would obviously be a learning curve there, but I think we are well equipped to uh, um, bridge that gap. And I think we're all very quick learners and um, we're definitely hungry, excited for the challenge. Absolutely. Brilliant. Well, I hope that's in your future. And uh, the way you described your aspirations for this season alone, I'll definitely be rooting for you. Um, let me let me hand back to Denz now, who will ask the last few questions that we have. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thank you there, Blag. And, and Kyle, great answers and responses there too, man. I, I think I learned so much from that. And also, it's really refreshing just to hear that commitment from someone like yourself, you know, inside the team, part of the fabric, you know, doing the kind of jobs that, you know, we don't see so much of on the TV, but is as pivotal as always to the success and, you know, making sure that the teams achieve the maximum results they can. So it was really interesting to hear the stuff that you said. And, you know, to, to line up the the mood of the podcast because we always like to chuck in a few goofy questions <laughs> as you can imagine Carl I've got a few hypotheticals for you from our fans and it'd be really intriguing to get your response so you ready for the first one Carl? Yeah let's go <laughs> perfect so the first one is I want you to imagine this so um Brian, you know, he's 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 still like he's still the amazing guy he is, but he's kind of getting on, and he he always comes across to me as quite composed and you know quite smooth. Whereas his son Colton, mm, you know, one of the leading prodigies of IndyCar and basically the face of the best overtake I ever saw in life last year on Pato Award. I cried because I'm a huge Pato Award fan. But anyway, getting to the point, Kyle. Um, I want you to imagine this. Colton Herter rocks up in, you know, a Hyundai um, touring car. And he says, Kyle, we're going to do a spin around a track of your choice. It could be any track of your choice. If you had to do a hot lap taxi kind of thing with Colton, which track would you pick and why? Oh, wow. That's a good one. Um, I think I'd go for um, one of the street circuits, uh, like a, a, a tight street circuit, like a Long Beach or, you know, the, the new Nashville track or even St. Pete. I think, you know, as somebody that used to race, I, when I do the track walks at places like um, Watkins Glen, Road America, VIR, places with um, lots of runoff and, and things like this, you know, I, I miss it a little bit and I'm like, Oh, I'd love to, I'd love to get to drive on a track like this. Um, but when I do track walks with drivers at street circuits where there's no runoff, it's guardrail, there's like 90 degree angles. Um, it, it is, it's kind of scary. And I, those are the moments where I'm very glad that I'm sitting on top of the pit stand with a headset on and not wearing a fire suit. 
Um, and so I, I just, I will never forget my first track walk at Long Beach and thinking like, this is crazy how fast they go through here. So I think that's, that would be really interesting to me um, because, you know, you see it, I, I guess the closest thing for you guys would be Monaco. Um, you see how razor close these drivers are able to get to these guardrails. Um, and that, that honestly is just mind blowing for me. So I think, I think a, a, a track like Long Beach would be really fun to um, get to get to trot around with Colton. Oh, absolutely. You know, and you mentioned the kind of uh, propositions there as well of like how technical these street circuits are and especially with a classic one like Long Beach, you know, that hairpin before the final straight, the fountain section, um, just how close the walls are as well. And actually on the topic of that as well, Kyle, like how sketchy, you know, does the car become once the circuit becomes rubbered up? Because I know like with the indie cars, for example, with the Firestones, they shed a lot of rubber after, you know, they've started to wear through the kind of sheen of the main canvas. And if you go offline to make an overtake, then, you know, you could find yourself quickly down the escape road if you're lucky and more likely into a barrier. But for a touring car, you know, is the traction control, is there any kind of electronic stability programs that help, you know, such scenarios and you know is there a long beach grand free for the series or you know is there any other kind of like races our fans could look forward to of a similar nature uh we don't go to long beach unfortunately um uh, we don't have traction control we do have a bosch abs system that works really well um you know touring cars are much bigger and heavier so the the um, the rubber or kind of marbles as some people call them don't really bother us as much um the biggest thing for us actually is if you um, uh, get some rubber pickup or build up on your rear tires sometimes it's tough to get it off because you're not putting enough energy into the rear tires so um, sometimes you'll form vibrations or um, some instability from like a big wad of rubber that gets stuck to your rear tire and you can't shake it off. So um, drivers also learning how to scrub their rear tires is, is an important skill. And um, I would say, um, you know, like Laguna Seca is always a good race to watch and turn in, tune into. I also got to give a shout out to um, the, the Lime Rock Park race this year. Uh, typically uh, the IMSA Michelin Pilot Challenge Series features both TCR and GS, which is a GT4 class, and we race at the same time. Um, Lime Rock this year will be the first race where TCR will be standalone. So um, I think it's going to be really cool, really exciting, and it's an opportunity for us to get an overall win for the, the first time in the series. So that would be a really good one to tune into as well. Oh, excellent. And I'm sure our listeners as well will be really keen eyed to, to pay attention to that. And of course, to join in and support, you know, the, the team as well in that endeavor, because it's really great. And those uh, circuits as well can be so challenging, even just like the Virginia International Raceway. Um, it was one of the races that was in the iRacing calendar last week. And I just saw a lot of like, uh, you know, like BMW V8, like prototype cars going off on the grass and trying to weave a Miss GT3 car. So even even with the absence of a multi-class aspect to the racing, it can still be super fun and super challenging. So it's really interesting to hear. And that will bring us on to the next question there, Kyle. So it's kind of like a double-barreled question, actually, on two different things. Uh, one of our listeners asked, who do you think is the most underrated driver in IndyCar? It could be a current driver or one of the past. And just in your own personal capacity, one of our viewers wanted to ask, which driver did you have the most fun to work with as an engineer? Ooh, that's tough. Um, I, uh, I feel like I got to say Colton Herta because, you know, he's, um, we're so close on all that stuff, but I, I think Colton gets, um, I think much deserved attention. Um, I think it's interesting that you, uh, mentioned Pato um, earlier because I think I almost think Pato Award would have a case for being the most underrated driver. I think you look at him and Colton's careers, they've been kind of um, neck and neck when they've been on track together, even as recently as their Indy Lights days. And, um, uh, you know, it's interesting. 
I feel like Colton gets so much more attention than Pato does when I think they're probably arguably two of the best drivers in IndyCar right now. And, um, you know, I think Colton's had a little bit more success with Andretti. Um, uh, they've been a little bit more successful than McLaren up to this point, but I think they McLaren showed a bit of a bounce back last year. And I think they've got a lot of optimism going into this year. So I think, I think Pato would honestly be a driver to watch this year. And I think, I could see him and Colton developing a really cool rivalry that hopefully brings IndyCar um, uh, continues to increase its popularity. Yeah, that was a great response. And how your respect points for me have literally gone up a thousand percent, my brother, because me and Black kind of have this like banterish kind of thing where he's a Rossi fan and I'm a Pato fan. So anytime he gets the opportunity to take a dig at me, he does. And of course, you know, because uh, Rossi did win his Indy 500 win under Brian Herter's team at the time, he used that for his propaganda. So thank you, Kyle, for your response. So I'm going to add that to my little propaganda file for uh, good old Pato and Pato. To a source, I like to say yeah, too. I've got uh, I've got a lot of love for Alex. Uh, his stock is down a little bit right now. He's got he's got a lot to prove this year, but I think he's going to do it. So might be a different answer this time next year. Um, but yeah, Ro Rossi should be really exciting this year. I, I think it's going to be a really good IndyCar season. Um, you also asked who my favorite driver to work with would be. Yeah, and I think I got to give a shout out to um, Alexander Sims, Alex. Uh, I think he's in Formula – he was in Formula E for a while. Um, and Alex and I worked together at uh, BMW on the GTLM cars. And uh, he's just um, uh, such an easy person to get along with. His communication is great. His feedback is great. And he's one of the most naturally gifted and talented drivers I've met. Um, uh, yeah, if you, if you don't know Alex Sims, you should check him out. Awesome, and thank you for the recommendation as well there, Carl, because we've got a lot of uh, fans that are into, obviously, the EMSA series and, and trying to find, obviously, more drivers to get behind, and the name does ring a bell for sure, so it's one I'll be adding to my list as well to keep an eye on, so really interesting to hear that too. And before the controversial question from Georgina, Carl, um, kind of the final motorsport question from uh, Black and I too, we always like to do this thing too called Taxi Dinner Avoid, and we're going to do an IndyCar edition because you're on the show today essentially the premise of it is carl is that you have to pick a driver imagine this this is a scenario so you're gonna go into town because i don't know by a miracle high and i say that they're gonna enter into the lmp class with a really cool striking prototype car so you know you have to get all dressed up in a tuxedo and you know play the part of course as the, the race engineer and um on your way there you have to take a taxi of course um, whilst you're in town, you're going to get some nice dinner and there'll be one person that you have to avoid as well. So to ask you the question, Carl, which IndyCar drivers on the current grid would you take a taxi drive with, have dinner with and avoid? And actually now I'm going to make it harder for you, Carl. You can't mention Colton or Pato or Rossi because we've actually just discussed them. <laughs> Look at me being evil. Oh, brutal. Uh, is is the driver driving the taxi that I'm in? Yeah, so they are your taxi driver to the dinner where you're going to be having dinner with another IndyCar driver. And whilst you're there, you know, there's one IndyCar driver which, you know, he, he said something really derogatory about, I don't know, Brian or, or, or Bobby or just any of the other idols you look forward to in, in, in IndyCar. So, yeah, we'll do it on that premise. Oh, goodness. Um, well... Scott Dixon's definitely got to be one of them. I would love to sit down with Scott and pick his brain for sure. Um, uh, I think I would probably have to avoid um, – I think I'd have to say like either Graham or Takuma Sato just because I've already spent so much time with them at Ray Hall. Um, <laughs> I would hope to try to meet, make some new experiences here. Um but definitely Scott Dixon, and then maybe maybe like a, a, a Will Power. Maybe I have dinner with Scott Dixon, and, and Will Power can drive me around in the taxi. Um, those are two people I would love to get some of their, um, uh, you know, everyone kind of has general philosophies, and I love to meet new 
motorsports personalities and kind of learn their philosophies on success. I think that's a really interesting take there, Carl. And it's interesting you've actually gone for the the kind of like elder statesman of the sports as well in terms of willpower and 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 obviously as well Scott Dixon because I mean, funny enough, you mentioned taxi for willpower because he just broke Mario Andretti's poor record, so you get you to your destination really quickly. But then jokes aside as well, like Scott seems like a really intriguing character. I mean, we had Jim Leo, the CEO of PitFit, come and speak to us a couple of months ago, and he's given us some really interesting stories. About about Scott and his like development as like you know a young driver in the IndyCar scene, winning the championships, winning the 500s, you know, and now being one of the more older drivers on the grid, and the experience he has, and the consistency he has throughout the season as well, and he's not one that you usually hear on the radio like getting really angsty or being too aggressive either. He's usually very calm very collected and you can see the years of experience that prop up and similar thing with with um with um will as well i mean i, I think you remember the kind of incident where he flipped the bird almost when his engine his poor engine was uh dying with the overheating conditions but then even with him this season you know i mean or oh, last season even he was always on the podium and not necessarily winning all the races, but just there, racking up the points, racking up the consistency, and just always, always in the top four. So I, I definitely see a point, and I think we'd be honoured to have you again, Carl, because it'd be interesting to hear your your take about Kamasato, another kind of former Indy 500 winner and a Formula One driver as well, along with somebody like you know um, Graham Ray Hall as well, which is the son of Bobby, and you know even with him this being a big name in the sport and one of the guys that, you know, usually voices their concerns or, or views on things when something goes down as well. Yeah, yeah. And I, you know, Scott Dixon was, uh, it was crazy to watch him also in, from the GTLM side. He would come over, um, you know, Ganassi was running the four GT um, competing against us when we were running the BMW M6 and M8. And, you know, Scott would come over and do the endurance races in the in the four gt and was instantly one of their top drivers um and i think one of my favorite parts about scott as a engineer is i think he's probably the best fuel saving driver um out there and it's such an important part of motorsports um you know it's it's something i'm always preaching young drivers and like a message for them is like you got to have switches like obviously you want to have that you know i can be faster than anybody switch but there's more to racing at the top level and being able to have a fuel saving switch or a, you know, tire saving switch, being able to kind of um, bounce in and out of these different driving styles is really important. And it's something Scott does really well. Absolutely. And we, we see it pay off week in, week out with some of the strategies they pull on the kind of fuel mileage races where it's very, very contingent on getting good gas mileage and, you know, not using push to pass and, and just the kind of little tips and tricks there as well that come into, you know, the IndyCar races as well. So really, really intriguing. Naturally, before we go to the final question, Kyle, who's your money on for the first race win at St. Pete's in like just over a month's time? I I gotta go with Colton Herta. I think he's uh, um, he's Colton is just itching to break through and get his first championship. And um, yeah, I'm definitely in his corner, hoping this is the year. Oh, absolutely. And I think a lot of us share that sentiment as well, Carl, because I don't want to tie you into it too much because I know, you know, your your situation. But like, even just as a fan, it was really devastating when we, we got the news that the super license system with the FIA and Formula One wasn't going to be adapted to enable him to actually make that step into F1 because a lot of us on the European side would love to see him here. But then, you know, if, if he wins or when he wins the IndyCar Championship, he'll be undeniable and I think his stocks will go up even more, you know, and he's already one of the most exciting drivers on the grid with the overtakes that he pulls and this, the, the masterclass drives that we've already seen him have at such a young age too. So um, we're definitely in the same camp with you for that one too. And, on to the final question before we round it up, Kyle. And a serious question. This one's actually from our host and, well, our owner, of course, Georgina. The question we like to ask all our special guests, Kyle. Pineapple on pizza, yay or nay? I'll say yay. I'm not I'm not ordering it for myself, but if it's there, I'm definitely eating it. 
Okay, okay. I'll I'll let you off on that one, Carl, because I was gonna say if you just just by force, just if you just had to do it, then then yeah, oh man, like ooh, that was a very point, diplomatic just... answer. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say, Georgie. Like, I... Carl was like my favorite guest with the pato and stuff, and I was listening to this answer keenly because like, ooh, but no, I think that was a good answer. Yeah, I'm not uh, I'm not as passionate as you guys are about it, unfortunately. I'm not never gonna yell at somebody for ordering pineapple on pizza, but uh, yeah, if it's there, I'm definitely taking a slice. Well, I'm a pineapple <laughs> pizza person and uh, well the others are not. <laughs> so you should be <laughs> Oh gosh. You see, this is why we don't let Georgina on the podcast episodes no more no more guys. <laughs> but anyways, <laughs> back to serious matters at hand. Kyle, it's been amazing to catch up with you, man. Like just to learn more about the stuff that you do, the touring car series as well, the car, the kind of like the man management behind the job as well is really pivotal. And a note that I always like to leave for our viewers, especially the younger ones. What advice would you give to a younger version of yourself? And you know, like you mentioned getting like a, a rejection or a decline for one or two teams. How do you find the resilience to bounce back if you're really passionate about something and you really want to achieve something? Oh, man, I, I definitely had a lot of help um, from f- friends, family, um, coworkers, my professors at school. Um, this is a really tough industry to get into those first couple of years. Um, you know, I was sending out dozens of resumes every year and only getting a handful of interviews and, you know, getting a a lot of no's and only a couple of yeses. So uh, it's, it's a grind. And I think the, I guess the advice would be is just like, there is light on the end of the, uh, on, at the end of the tunnel. And um, once you're in the industry, it's, it's a, a lot easier to an extent because it's a tight knit community. And if you are um, working hard and, and uh, treating people with respect, like that travels, um, that reputation carries. And, um, you know, when, when a team goes under, the top people on that team, their phone is blowing up with people trying to hire them. You know, right now, I think the industry is actually really hurting for good employees. Um, but at the same time, the top teams aren't willing to take risks on young, inexperienced talent. And I think that's where Brian has shined is he takes risks on young people like myself and, and hopefully it pays off. Um, so yeah, it's just, you got to keep grinding and know that once you get two or three years into the industry, then that's when you can start to relax a little bit. Um, because, you know, resumes with two to five years experience are in high demand right now. Whereas, um, you know, as somebody that looks a lot of, at a lot of resumes, there are a lot out there with zero experience. And so getting those first couple of years of experience are the toughest part. Absolutely there, Carl. And thank you as well for that advice, advice as well, because I feel it's the stuff that as humans, we, we always go through and it's not something that they ever really talk about too much in high school or college. And, and just that real life experience always kind of hits you the hardest. And they always say that, you know, taking the first step is always the, the, the most difficult. But once you actually break your foot into the mold and, and you know, get the experiences and, and kind of network and, and build, ex, um, you know, just confidence within that field as well it helps so we're super thankful to you for that amazing advice and it's really valuable for our listeners as well especially the young ones before you round up black with any final words or anything else that you wanted to you know mention at this stage no just an offer to kyle you know next uh next off season when you think about writing your leadership uh guide you know if you need a ghost writer then just shout me out you know i'm happy to help yeah, I'd definitely take you up on that offer. I'll uh, I'll call you here in about 11 months. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> right then. Well, thank you for that, Black. And obviously, Carl, thank you so much for your time. You're a great ambassador and obviously an amazing member and team of Brian Herter Autosport. I'm sure that he thinks of highly as you of you as we do. And um, we're just so thankful, you know, for having this conversation with you. It does so much for this us, our listeners, you know, people out there, which, you know, might just be on the verge of giving up or or not even really you know like trying to make the effort and through listening to your experiences your hardships your challenges it gives them that lease of life to at least give it another try and to keep pushing and to not get up 
uh, give up because ultimately at the end of the day, if you, you give up, then you don't know what you can achieve. And if you don't know what you can achieve, you always stay at one level and you always think of what could have been, which I think is the great regret that we all, you know, fear. So thank you so much, Kyle. And yeah, any final words from you before we wrap up? Yeah, I think the industry, the sport is hurting and is desperate for um, new young talent and um, young problem solvers. Um, it's uh, it's a lot of fun and it's a rewarding uh, industry to be in. It's a lot of work, obviously a lot of a lot of hours and days spent on the road. But um, you know, it's it's not it's constantly changing. It's short project timelines, fast paced. Um, keeps you interested and engaged and um, we are always looking for for young problem solvers really and and uh, I think the the industry could do well for for um, an influx of youth so uh, for those of you wondering and considering getting into it just make the leap we, we the, the industry needs you excellent news there Carlin and thank you for that as well because it's really reassuring and a lot of people will take confidence and and kind of like a, a crumb of comfort at least in knowing that there are opportunities out there and if you keep digging you keep working hard enough you know you shall seek the rewards of your hard work so um you know not a greater example of that than you yourself and uh, we wish you all the best with your endeavors with the team with the series as well we're going to continue to keep an eye on you guys and be supporting you all the way and um it's the a pleasure Carl we'll have to get you back on hopefully during the summer or later on in the year just to see how things progress to talk IndyCar as well because there's always a story there and uh yeah you've been an amazing guest so thank you for coming on and uh yeah guys it's been another episode of the Stripping the Dipping podcast not a legendary episode make sure you follow Kyle Compton on all social media platforms as well I'm sure if you want to reach out to him on LinkedIn as well, you know, I'm not saying I can get your job or anything, no pressure, but, uh, you know, definitely a very wise and very uh, useful contact to have. And uh, yeah, if you just want to follow the team as well, make sure you do so. Georgina will be putting all the links out with the description and tweet that comes out with this video. And we hope that you guys stay engaged and, uh, you know, enjoy it as always, because we've got an exciting year of more racing to look forward to. And Carl, it's been a pleasure to have you on. Thanks for having me. Ah, oh, no worries at all. Well, guys, it's been another episode of Stripping the Dipping. It's your boy, AMG Dent, a.k.a. Monday Morgan Freeman, and my brilliant co-host as well, F1 Black. We're out. Peace.